Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. These chats are fun, informative, and hopefully always interesting. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. In today's episode, I speak with Johnny Lyle, a marketing and digital director for the attractions industries. Johnny advises Sundown Adventureland and Audien Miniature Railway. And in the past, his work with Be Wilderwood won a coveted DBA Gold Award and Drum Grand Prix for the best marketing launch. We discuss how he's advised attractions about digital marketing throughout lockdown and what lies ahead for attractions in the UK. Johnny, welcome to the podcast. It's so lovely to have you on today. Well, thank you for having me. You are very welcome. So we were introduced quite early on in lockdown, weren't we, by a mutual friend of ours, lovely Rachel. Yeah. And I think for me, that's been one of the really great things about this situation. You know, always looking at the positives. Um, I've been able to talk to some really interesting, really fun people because everyone's had a little bit more time to give up. Um, but we don't know each other that well. So what I like to do at the beginning of any of our podcast interviews is just do a little icebreaker round. Now, you haven't been able to prepare any answers for this, so you don't know what's coming. So I'm going to... I'm going to kick off. You look worried. <laughs> yeah, I am, yeah, yeah. Don't be. Right, okay, so first question. Do you prefer books or podcasts? Books. As you can see on the video with about <laughs> how many books I'm surrounded by. There's something about the smell, isn't there, for, for me? Yeah. Like, that's, that's what does it for me. I've never been a big fan of a Kindle. I like to have that, that kind of paper feeling and that smell. Uh, most, of, most of my reading is on a Kindle now, to be honest, but these are the books that I can't part with. So every, I've read every one in here, and these are the ones I won't part with. There's lots more I've read, but these are the only, only the ones my favourites. Oh, good. All right, well, we'll come to that later, because I've got a question about a book for you. Um, what is the worst job that you've ever had? I worked for a... When I was at university, I was temping, and I did two. One of them was delivering uh, for a soft drinks company into pubs at four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. And the other one was genuinely working at a tip, picking up the rubbish that had blown up onto the uh, fence around the outside. So the job title was Womble as a litter picker (laughs) in a rubbish tip. Actually Um, Womble. (laughs) Which was actually very well paid uh, because no one wanted to do it. It allowed me to buy a car in my first year of university. So it was good. A means to an end. Good job. Yeah. Final icebreaker question. This is my favourite question. So can you tell me something that's true to you that almost nobody agrees with you on? So like, what is your unpopular opinion? That Oxford United are worthy winners in tomorrow's and Monday's playoffs and should have always been in the Championship or the Premiership. Oh, I feel like this is controversial. <laughs> It's not controversial for me. It's an absolute fact. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. We'll leave that there. <laughs> but, but depending on when this goes out, I might already have been proved wrong, might I? If we lose the playoffs, so. Uh... Okay. So look, how long you've been? You are, you know, a, a marketing specialist working in the attraction sector. How long have you been working in the industry? And and, and what kind of like what's a kind of typical project for you? So officially. The first project I did was started in about 2007. Um, I, at the time, I was running a brand consultancy and I'd just lost my father and was offered a project to work in house with a client for a period of time for a company called Treehouse Company, getting them ready. They had a new product called the Bothy Lodge Company and they wanted to take it to IPO. So I went in as sort of acting market director for a few months to get them ready for that. Treehouse Company had a contract to build a treehouse adventure play place over in Norfolk, which at the time was going to be called Kingswater, uh, and which ultimately became uh, Bewilderwood. So I met my now very, very good friend, Simon Egan, um, who I still work with because we've now got a company together, Capco, where we build great big adventure play things. Uh, But we've done Castle Howard and Culane and Lowther Castle and Fort Douglas and places like that. so we started that and it just took off. Um, our plan was to have 35,000 visitors a year in the first year, 
and we got 12,000 in the second week. Gosh. Um, and then it, it just went ballistic. It was a just total overnight success. It won a Thea um, as the best children's attraction in the world-ish at the time. Uh, it won DBA Gold, which is my award up here. It won uh, the Drum Grand Prix for best marketing launch. Um, it just it just cleaned up. It won everything. A treehouse company won tons as well that year, actually, as well. So it was quite good. Um, and then from that, just more and more people asked me whether I would get involved with them. Uh, and eventually I left the design agency, my own design agency, and sold it to my partners so I could focus more on this. Nice. So probably eight, eight years full time now in, in, in doing this. Yeah. So as an agency owner myself, uh, you've got a coveted DBA award. So yeah, that was the first time we'd ever entered that and it was the same year as the launch of the mini so we were up there with the, and the beijing olympics one i think at the same time as well so it was wow. uh, always that with when we won the theater um so it was yeah it was a good year <laughs> nice and so what so you so that was so it's eight years that you've been working as a consultant yeah what kind of things do you get involved in now so what's what how do you advise attractions there's two sort of typical no i'm sure you'd expect me to say there's nothing typical but there's sort of two types of work the first one is when an attraction's failing or something's gone wrong um, a couple of years ago i had two in succession where the digital agency had built the website and left it blocked from google um, as they launched it mm. and cost them all of their web traffic and so i went in to find out what was wrong and sort it out um, and then the second is when they want a new way of thinking. So it might be reviewing their internal team. It might be to reposition the attraction. So the one uh, near South and Walden that you know well is Audley a Miniature Railway. So we moved that from being a miniature railway that old miniature railway enthusiasts would go to into being a family attraction where um, young families would go. And doing so, again, grew it from 50,000 to 110,000 a year. And profitability so uh, those are the sorts of things that, but in, I guess the main part of it is I don't want to be the one necessarily going in and actually doing the work I'd much rather if there was already an in-house team there uh, and they needed training or upskilling or uh, be you know, help with some rethinking really more than anything uh, I'm certainly not trying to go in and replace anyone I don't want their jobs I'm, I'm not a threat to them in theory I should only ever be an asset to them so how, how has it been for you um, throughout this period? I mean, attractions have been closed. It's been really difficult. You talked a little bit there about, you know, a typical project for you going, um, you know, taking the visitor numbers from 50,000 up to 100,000 plus. Um, at the moment, that's really challenging. Uh, we've got attractions that have got capped to capacity. They can only take so many people through the doors. And that's if some of them can open and they're able to open within the restrictions that we've currently have in terms of people's safety. So yeah, how has it been for you during lockdown? What have you been, what have you been able to help them with and advise them with? Uh, the main thing for me was sort of continuing to communicate is actually keep talking, um, try and keep front of mind um, because a with everyone loads of people just furloughed all their marketing staff almost overnight so that made it really difficult because uh, it just wasn't people there weren't people there to do the work uh, so it, it's been trying to keep a low level of communication without sort of certainly not whining keeping positive keeping um sort of saying we're really looking forward to having you back when we can uh, and making sure that they could see that you were taking every step to protect them going forward and and it's still a fun place to look forward to coming back to, but it's been a real, it was a real challenge because you know, uh, almost everyone switched off. I think everyone went into total rabbit in the headlights. No one knew what to do. Um, so certainly the attractions I worked with, they just went very, very quiet. Uh, there was big stress in terms of choosing when to close. Uh, and I think with the ones I worked with the most closely, they, closed early they actually went a bit early and got really really good feedback from their customers for it in both cases in the, in the two i work very closely um so now it's a case of making sure you don't go back too early i think and don't suddenly aim for as big a capacity as you can possibly get away with because i just don't think people are going to feel safe yeah i think you're right actually and that's similar conversations that we've been having with our clients is is 
they need to be ready and they need to make sure that they've worked through the procedures and they need to make sure that it is safe and a welcoming and a, and a happy place for people to be back at. Um, yeah. So I think you're totally right about people not, you know, not rushing into to reopening. It's the right, it's the right way to approach it. I guess it's the same. We've had similar conversations with the clients that we work for um, in terms of trying to keep that conversation going um, even while you're closed, you know, if you can't be open and have people there still be part of that conversation. Um, have you, did you kind of speak to any of your, um, clients around like virtual tours or, um, producing content that people could use at home as well? We did, we did a lot of that. Um, the, the Sundown Adventureland, it was a beautiful old attraction. They produced a lot of sort of things for kids to do at home so there's lots of coloring lots of little puzzles and all sorts of bits uh, and we did one sort of quite sort of behind the scenes tour about how one of the rides was actually made for those you know, who were interested uh, and that you know that went really well uh, and i think that was again one of my lessons i think was be generous uh give you know, give stuff away because it will come back it, it will you'll be rewarded by being generous. Don't be grabby at all. You know, I think there was people charging for some of these downloads at one point and that very, very quickly got uh, stopped. So there wasn't, the ones I worked with didn't do masses because they're not particularly big attractions. You know, they're sort of like the, up to 300,000 ish. Uh, that tends to be where I work. Um, so they didn't do masses because uh, they don't necessarily have really, really distant appeal they're still sort of relatively local markets yeah. so yeah it was a balance between keeping them on board and not talking to them too much again on the nerves <laughs> yeah it's a fine line isn't it because you like you say a lot of the the teams were furloughed and they're running a really kind of um scaled back you know skeleton team you kind of you want to help but you don't want to be imposing you don't want to be a burden or, or an annoyance to them at any point as well yeah. um yeah it's been but, really difficult but the big opportunity that uh, i think we did take was it's just it was a fabulous opportunity you know the the other guy blinked the uh um who's that little story about pepsi and cola and coke in the cola wars uh was it was a brilliant opportunity to really work on your SEO and really work on your content of your site. So I did a lot of that, a lot of groundwork and a lot of work on uh, Google business uh, and looking at local links and citations and getting that groundwork in that will come back when we start, when people start searching again for what to do. And that was, I've loved that. That's been, that's been brilliant. And I'm, I'm quite looking forward to seeing what the results of some of those are going to be. <laughs> yeah, that's nice, isn't it? You know, like you say, put the groundwork in while you were closed. If you could focus on some of those things, you know, getting the getting all your ducks in a row, as they say, um, yeah. you're going to be in a better place for when you open. The weekend is approaching where attractions, if they can and are able to open safely, they will be. Um, what's the current mood like with some of your attractions as they start to plan that opening? Uh, nervous i think uh, and i think nervous for their teams as well because they're they're very close to their teams they want to make sure they're not putting their own teams at risk um but the business model is going to be completely different and i think the, the critical bit in the first few weeks is going to be TripAdvisor reviews and facebook reviews what people say because uh, they're going to make or break attractions i think in the next few weeks and if people have gone in to they're going to allow too many people in. People don't feel safe. They're not going to be afraid to tell other people. Mm. Uh, and I think then you will destroy the whole of the rest of your year if you try and take too many. If you go much above 30% capacity, 40% capacity by the summer, then I think you really are uh, taking a massive risk. Um, and the next big one, I think, is going to be most attractions have an indoor Christmas experience. Uh, if you get it wrong now, you're not going to have any form of indoor Christmas experience either. So that's going to be, you've got to get it right. You've got to not take too much or try and take too much now because otherwise I think you could lose everything. Gosh, that's quite, it's quite frightening to think about that, isn't it? And Christmas at the moment seems like really far away, but obviously we know that a lot of the Christmas campaigns start to be planned you know yeah. now if not previous if not just before now and things like halloween and not, um, and those kind of activities too start to be planned so yeah i guess it's just really difficult um 
even with a capacity of, of 30%, like you say, that's been set, we still don't really know if they're going to achieve that. I mean, what we've seen recently, which has been brilliant, is the overwhelming demand for zoos and outdoor activities. Yeah. We're not sure that we're going to get the same uh, kind of surgeons for indoor attractions and that's that's the big challenge for them i think at the moment no people are still definitely more nervous about indoor aren't they there's there's no doubt about that um the problem is though i think for a lot of attractions they, they've got to, their business model's got to change because if you think a lot of attractions summer can be 30 percent, 40 percent of turnover christmas can again be 25 30 percent of turnover um if you could only operate on 30 40 percent capacity of your on your biggest months then your business model means you're only going to do 40% of your annual turnover potentially. So you've got to be able to get through until at the earliest next summer, I think, before we could be back to any form of normality. So what kind of things can you, have you been advising your, your clients for, to do, to, that they can do now and then they can continue to do for the future? Because I guess, you know, the, big, the bigger question is, what is the future for attractions? And at the moment, it's a, that's a really tough question to ask because... I think that most of us sitting here, we don't know what the next two weeks will bring, let alone what the next no. two months will bring. But, you know, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on what attractions can do now to start a booster in their marketing? Um, and have you been able to kind of, have you been looking at advising your clients about what they can do now and, and for the next few months? I think the main thing is, is trying to welcome people back trying to make sure that it is fun. It's more about having fun than them thinking they're at risk. If they're walking into an attraction, looking over their shoulder, thinking, oh, I wonder if he's got it, I wonder if they've got it, then they're not going to come back. So um, the main one I've been rabbiting on about all the time is making sure that your staff are smiling um, because that smile first, ask questions later has always been something I've tried to work to. Um, and I think if you don't make it, a fun place to be first and foremost people won't come back so uh, other than that it's hunker down and make sure you try and keep your cost to an absolute minimum and maximize the fun and try and survive uh, i know that sounds incredibly negative but it's it, i don't know if unless you've really done the maths i think there's it's going to be an incredibly tough period for most attractions yeah particularly the ones who are highly geared so the ones who've borrowed money big money in the last few years are going to uh, and they're dependent on the numbers then like the merlins of this world who you know they are going to find it very very tough because i know people will go back i know they're open and you can walk around the grounds now uh, but they're going to be operating on tiny capacities aren't they so yeah i guess that's um that's something that we've been talking a little bit about the last couple of weeks at the studio, actually, you know, maximizing the revenue from the visitors that can come through your doors. So, you know, have you, how are you looking at the retail environment that you've got on site? Most attractions are opening uh, and offering booking time slots. So that's something that we've been talking to our clients about. Can they book um, food slots while they're there can they book a time a, a slot in the retail environment so that they feel safer but also you're kind of driving them to maybe while they're there just capture as much revenue from them as as you possibly can at that point I don't know if that's something that you've been talking to uh, to your clients about as well not much but we did I did a big zoom the other day with uh, about uh, uh, 10 attractions uh the capco clients we spoke to a lot of them and one really interesting one was uh, bean who runs chobham adventure farm he's, he's a real innovator um and they're making sure they're so they're doing it on time slots two two or three hour time slots can't remember um but each of the people who are booking are being allocated a table um right. within the place as well they're doing full food service it's still you walk up and you get your food but there's obviously social distancing within the queuing um, because food is a really important part of their offer. Uh, but they're also offering the ability for people to upgrade. It's a bit right there, but you can actually choose which table you want for a little bit extra. Uh, okay. So you can get a table in one of the better areas. Um, I think there's a real danger, though, that attractions are, if you're caught profiteering, if you're caught putting prices up, if you're caught doing anything like that, then again, that will come back and haunt you. It'll just it'll come back in reviews. And we've seen that on Amazon, actually. Amazon have kicked off a lot of suppliers who were profiteering, who were you know, doing the £500 toilet roll trick or whatever. Um, and I've, if they're doing it, then 
TripAdvisor, Facebook are going to do it just from your reviews. So I think it's about trying to increase dwell time so people will eat. Uh, retail is going to be really difficult because uh, all the advice that's come from the government, that's come from NFAN and all the other bodies has said don't direct people out through your shop. Um, so retail in the attractions is going to be very hard hit. But I think what we've looked at is more pop-ups, is to make more other small places around the park. So actually you can go and get an ice cream, you can go and get a drink, you can go and get a slush, you can go and you know, buy a, a memento somewhere else. Uh, so it's not all in one big retail environment. Right. So you're not funneling people through that that area. I guess it's hard as well, isn't it? Because we do obviously have to consider that a, a lot of us are going to be... Um, it, it, this is a difficult time for so many people and we're going to be struggling in time in terms of what what money we actually have coming in so um you know not everybody's going to have the same amount of 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 you know free money that they had to spend previously it's in it and you need to get that marketing you need to get it really right it has to be really sympathetic and empathetic and yeah but a lot of people have been furloughed remember and been on full pay or 80 percent pay sitting at home doing nothing with almost no outgoing so um, all the research again showed a different view did a lot of research um, and Alva did a lot of research and all of that research said in the sort of sentiment surveys that people weren't expecting to be discounted they, they were quite happy to come back and pay full price Even, and I think we've seen that already again with the zoos I know we have with Cotswold Wildlife Park as well uh, that even that some of the bits of the attractions are closed they're actually still quite happy to come in and pay uh, which is, you know, is really encouraging. I guess at this stage, it's probably the very loyal customers who are coming back first. Um, and some of the others will be more choosy. I've seen a lot of talk on Facebook again from customers saying, it's too early for us yet. We're still shielding or with um, you know, little Doris is not well enough. We don't want to take that risk. So if you make it so it's a great place to be for your regular customers, then and try and live off them and work with them and make sure they have a great time. Then the others will come back. I'm sure. Yeah. So a big question. And I know it's probably one that can't be answered, but what do you think that the future looks like for attractions in the UK? Uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Um, I think there'll be some weeding out. I think there'll be some who, I think there's going to be a big unemployment hit, which is going to be harder for attractions because whilst people are on furlough, they're not being laid off by companies. And I'm, yeah, we're already seeing it in the Northwest. There's, there's some adjustment. Airbus are laying people off. I think Derby, Rolls-Royce are laying people off. There's, um, there's going to be layoffs in some quite big numbers around. So that's going to hit the economy very hard. Uh, and it's still a discretionary spend. So we've just got to make sure that we deliver great value and great fun uh, and an escape. Uh, the advantage I guess we've got this year is that less people are going to be traveling overseas so more people are going to be uh, staycationing um, and enjoying what's around them um, but I don't think I've got any specific sort of long-term thoughts yet we've just got to see how this emerges as we come out but I think the the weaker ones will will really struggle as we've already seen that in football I know you like your football as well but yeah we're going out of, you know, going out of business and there's going to be others like that aren't there and uh, football is a bit of a mess in lots of ways so I think the attractions because it's again a discretionary spend it's something that people do for fun uh, is is going to be challenged yeah yeah you mentioned football I mean I may as well get it out in the open about being a Tottenham fan which you know, has, has its has its pros and cons. Um, yeah. But yeah, but you know, similarly, Lee and I have both got. Uh, we have season tickets, and we have no idea when we're going to go back, and we have no idea how that's going to work. Or and you take yeah, if you take some of the bigger attractions. One of my favourite attractions I've ever been to is Puy de Fou in in France. Incredible, you know, no rides, but all shows. It's got sort of like ten different shows. It's the most incredible attraction I've ever been to. And then you've got the. There's the one uh, Kinran up in Newcastle, uh, sort of, sort of northwest or northeast, which I've been to as well, which sort of grew from Puy de Fou. And they've got another uh, big evening show at Puy de Fou, which only runs about 50 nights a year, say. They've got 14,000 people in a stand, all right next to each other, sitting next to each other, and 2,000 people in the cast. How are they going to run that? I can't, A, it can't run unless you can fill it because it can't possibly be profitable um it's it's going to be 
so difficult for them and they're going to have to adjust their business model they're either going to have to build massive temporary stands to allow that many people to sit there but be twice as far apart or they're going to, have to say well we're outside anyway so it'll probably be okay mm. um yeah there's there's really obviously really major adjustments to come yeah uh, and i think still one of the other ones again i know i mentioned Merlin before if you take the big rides you know the really big thrill rides a lot of the time on those rides is spent in the pre-show is the sort of queuing section and the pre-show evolved because they were trying to make it so you weren't really queuing you were actually enjoying the pre-show you were sort of being warmed up ready for the ride most of those are indoors a lot of those are going to have to be removed so if all you're going to do is walk straight onto the front or you know, a long social distance queue and then walk and get onto the ride without as much of the pre-show it's just not going to be as much fun it's not going to be you're not going to have been warmed up in the same way. So you're not going to be as, having the same level of expectation about that ride. So that will be quite different, I think, again. Mm. Yeah, so opening up, but still it's a long journey, a long road ahead for, for many of the attractions and, and, and the way that they're set up. And lots of changes that's going to need to be made. Well, I, um, I sound like I've been really negative, and I, I don't mean to be, but I'm just I'm, I'm trying to be pragmatic and think of what you can do. And that, that, that so much of that is still come back to the welcome it's got to be about the welcome and make sure that the ones you can get and the ones who are there you just absolutely welcome them with open arms and make them feel safe and loved and uh, and as though they're going to have a great day help them have a great day because that's what going out to these places is like isn't it? it has to be about having a great day yeah we spoke um so when i spoke to ben he talked a lot about uh the the kind of front of house and actually it's the front of house team that really make that experience and we know that we know that you know if you if you arrive somewhere and you know it feels magical because the people are magical you know that that's the start of the of the fun isn't it so i yeah. completely i completely hear where you're coming from um and it's a difficult question we just don't know what's coming next but you're right if you've got if you are able to bring back people make them feel as welcome and as happy and as they're in the best place in the world yeah so what at the moment what's the biggest challenge that you have with your role at the moment and and how can you how do you think that you'll over come it i think my biggest challenge is being 54 <laughs> um is being a digital marketing specialist at 54 is a lot a lot of people assume it's a young person's game um and so at the moment i'm still lucky enough to be taken seriously by people with it in it because i've got a track record but i think as i get another few years on are you going to want a 60 year old to come in and look at your digital marketing and i don't i don't know whether people will so it's a completely personal thing and i think that's going to be difficult so i think i've got to evolve more into leading and training than actually doing um but i'm interested enough to keep seeing what's what matters and what's changing but i i guess that's going to get harder and harder you're lucky you're really young so uh yeah not that young but yeah it's not that long you, you haven't got many years on me <laughs> you'd be surprised <laughs> I, hear, I, I hear what you're saying though because i guess I, I i kind of i look at that and think well yeah i mean i run a digital agency now but i'm 42 yeah well yeah again will i what will i be when i'm 50 will i will i be running a digital age i just i don't know yeah i guess there's the yeah, same, no, that, same kind of perception the, i've been talking about that a lot with my family to be honest um and it's one i've always got some form of side hustle going i've always got some online business that i'm running somewhere or other that i'm trialing uh and i guess it's uh, have another go at some of them and see where they emerge but really continue to focus on i think more to do more towards training and leadership than um and look overviewing than actually doing because with one of my clients i still actually do all the work i still write all the content and produce all the all the social media stuff so which is brilliant because it keeps you you know, very very close to it and you can see what works and you can measure what works but i can't see myself being able to do that or wanting to do that in another five years to be honest yeah so one of the things that are, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, I said, you know, we were introduced by a mutual friend and, and this has been, this has been one of the positives that I can take from this period is that I've had time and people have been generous to give me their time to, to chat and just to meet really interesting people. What, what's the kind of the biggest surprise that you've had over the last few months and, and why? Well, you asked me a question earlier about what's my sort of unpopular opinion. I almost used this one then. And I think it's how nice the weather is when there's no planes flying and there's no cars on the road. 
because I just can't believe the two are unrelated. Um, that if we're chucking pollution into the top of the sky uh, with planes, then we're going to make clouds and we're not going to have nice weather. I'll say that now, it's absolutely chucking it outside, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but the traffic has picked right back up again, isn't it? Um, and I think I've, I was surprised. I was really nervous at first about taking this forced time off because I've never really done it before. And I was nervous about what the future held and work and the like. And I've actually, I just relaxed into it really quickly and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've baked a load of bread and I've made a load of lovely food and we walked the entire Wirral coastline and poor dog is exhausted from it and just actually enjoyed a slower pace of life that I've just, I've genuinely never had since I started my first business at 23. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? It's been, um, again, that's definitely a plus, reconnecting a little bit more with nature and just taking that time that we've been, I guess we have to say that we've been gifted it just to slow, slow things down a little bit. Yeah, I've, I've worked, I've, I've sort of mostly sat down at my desk most, nearly every day still. So I didn't completely get out of the habit of it, but I very rarely worked beyond three o'clock. And, uh, and then by three o'clock, oh, gin and tonic, and uh, sit out <laughs> in the garden with my feet up and read my book. It's been, yeah. Oh, delightful. <laughs> okay, book. Well, that brings us on to our last question. So... We like to ask our guests uh, if they have a book that they would recommend that's helped shape your career. I'm going to cheat. I can't narrow it down to one, oh. so I'm going to na- I'm You're going to do two, to- aren't you? Oh, three? three? Oh, you're killing me. Right, right. three. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey. I read it probably 20 years ago for the first time, and it the Live, Love, Leave a Legacy, that bit about making sure you think about what you leave behind was critical. It changed everything about the way I thought. That's the first one. The second one, which is directly related to be honest, is Five People You'll Meet in Heaven by Mitch Olver, uh, which is shows the effect of what you're saying and what you're doing has on other people and makes you much more conscious of the impact you can have consciously or subconsciously. Uh, and really does make you moderate your behaviour because I'm prone to being a loud mouth know all and I'm really learned to think about what I'm saying because of that. And then the third one, which is absolutely brilliant, everyone should read it, is called Fish by Stephen London, uh, which is about the guys who work in the Seattle fish market. And it's all about choose your attitude. Um, you absolutely not only choose your attitude, you decide what you want to what you want to be when you get into work. And that was fantastic. And again, in my design agency days, we put a whole staff through a training session on that. We did a whole day training session just with that one book and film. Uh, and they all have had a massive positive impact on me, as well as about 10,000 other books. So, uh, but yeah, those are the three that I could narrow it down to. Oh, great. I mean, great choices. Um, but also, you guys are blowing my book budget because what we do is we offer people with a chance to win the book, but now it's books. Ben had two books as well. You're killing me. Right. Okay. Look, if you'd like Sorry. to win a copy of Johnny's books, then um, if you head over to our Twitter account, which is Skip the Queue, uh, and you retweet this episode announcement with the comment, I want Johnny's books, then you'll be in with a chance of winning them. Them. (laughs) I'll get get my Amazon order in now. (laughs) Yeah. Our daughter runs a coffee shop in Nottingham, and she has just started getting into shit. I want to get, I want to develop myself. I want to get better. And so I sent her a copy of the fish book as one to start with. And she was totally and utterly blown away with it and is now buying copies of herself for all her staff and actually running a training session with all her staff just to go through that. Oh, uh, that's because great. it had such an impact on her. No, well, that's a good sign of a book, isn't it? You know, I think um, we've done that a few times where books have had a real kind of, um, you know, a moment with us and we've given copies of them to our clients or given copies of them to, you know, people that have, you know, referred us or, or, or things like that. So that's a, that's a real testament to a good book. Well, I'm secondhand on Amazon. They're only a few (laughs) pence and you pay two pound 80 delivery. It's got to be worth it. You don't even need to buy them new, buy them secondhand, recycle them. I'm happy with, I'm happy with secondhand books. That's what you might be. That's what you might all be getting listeners. (laughs) Yeah. Don't buy, don't, don't buy new, buy secondhand. There's no point in wasting more paper printing new ones when there's loads of old copies about. Johnny, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's been a really real pleasure to have you on. Um, 
lots of changes come in. It will be interesting to see what the next few months look like. Maybe we can catch up again after Christmas and see where we're all at. Yeah, Christmas is going to be the big one, isn't it? Let's see, let's see what state everyone's in when we get to Christmas and, uh, and then smile our way through Christmas and then have a brilliant next year. We've got to write this year. I think we've got to write this year off it's, uh, and then have a brilliant one next year. 2021's the one. Yeah, it is. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.